everybody. Welcome. For those of you who are here before, welcome back. For those of you who are just joining us for this um, lecture, we're happy to have you. On behalf of the House of Seven Cable staff, I'm Pilar Garo. Um, I'm the Director of Development, so we're thrilled to have you here today. Who's doing the tour after that? Okay, great. Okay, it's going to be fantastic. So we're delighted to have you here. Just a reminder, this is our 350th anniversary. So we have some amazing programs um, scheduled throughout the year. So you probably have some on your chairs, just a list of that. But one of the things coming up, we have Caroline Emerton's um, birthday coming up. So that's exciting. We also have a walk with Nathaniel Hawthorne. We have our own Caroline Emerson who portrays her in fact, but I won't spoil that. You married to know her. <laughs> so, um, so that's really wonderful. And I just wanted to um, remind you of membership. If you're not yet a member of the House of Seven Gables, we have a mission, a dual mission of preservation and education. And membership certainly helps us support us continue that. So please join us. You get discounts on programs like this or free for members. And of course, admission is free. So thank you so much. And I want to introduce Donna Seeger, who is the chair of the history department at Salem State University. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> and will be talking to us about more preservation topics and women in preservation. Thanks so much. Thank you for your patience while we got set up. Um, can you all hear me? I'd rather not use the microphone. Yes. We had a little issue with it, and also I'd rather not use it. I'm the kind of teacher who roams around a lot, and uh, my students have called me a caged tiger. <laughs> so it's very polite. <laughs> so it's very hard for me to just stay at a podium. But can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. If for some reason you can't, just raise your hands like this and I'll, I'll go up. But usually once I get in my cadence, I start in my cadence. Um, I want to thank you all for being here today at the House of Seven Gables, which itself, of course, is an important monument of women's history, is it not? It is. Um, and uh, it's a busy day. It's a very busy day in Salem. It's always a busy day in Salem, but it's <laughs> particularly busy. So thank you for choosing me. And us. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I am, just a disclaimer, I've been giving a lot of talks this year, and I always have to give the number one disclaimer, which is I am not an American historian. I have a PhD in history, but it's European history. Um, about seven years ago, I started a blog called Streets of Salem. And it was my own kind of personal way to explore Salem's history which I was a little, I thought was a little one-dimensional, frankly. <laughs> and there were a lot of things that I was curious about, and so I started blogging. I had a lot of help with some people here, including Nelson and I, I, and because it is a blog, um, I became very dependent on sort of visual history, uh, because that's what people want to see on the blog. And one of the people that really helped me uh, understand a lot of things, a lot of different things about Salem history was Mary Herring Norland, uh, who was in her day a national best-selling author. Okay, how many of you heard, have heard of Mary Herring Norland today? Okay, that's pretty good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be exploring her career with her. I, 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 I think maybe at the end, I'm not quite sure I can call her preservation. So I'm kind of here under, under false pretenses again. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, but towards the end, maybe I'll get there, and then maybe we can discuss it. Um, certainly in her time, uh, she contributed towards the preservation effort. Um, so I will say that, and then we'll round up after we go through it and discuss whether we could call her a proper preservationist. Um, OK. So let's just start with an overview. These are the themes that I'm going to be talking about today, specifically. Um, she lives, she has a lifetime here, 1815 to 1926, in which Salem was experiencing, America was experiencing rapid change, dynamic change. Um, and her career, her books were kind of a response to that change. Um, she is definitely focusing on the old, the old time, old time. That, I mean, if you read her books, that's that old time, old fashioned, old, it's like in every other sense. Uh, she's going back there. Um, so her, her 
response, along with many, and I want to put her in a proper context for all of us, uh, is to really focus on, on preserving or bringing back. Preserving or bringing back. Um, so you see both preservation and colonial revival movements um, emerge at this time period, and she's kind of right in the center of them. Uh, with a particularly entrepreneurial bent. That's what I really like about her. She's very interesting. That's why I put her in the company of Martha Stewart. Mm -hmm. I really do think she is the turn of the century Martha Stewart. I really, really do. That's the case I'm going to make for her. Um, and I mean that in a good way and kind of a way. <laughs> All right? She is definitely into craftsmanship, not just traditional craftsmanship, but also crafting a career for herself, uh, which is very much based on her connections. She's one of these old New England families, uh, and she definitely works it. And so it's interesting. She's an interesting window into social time as well, because she thinks, she goes into everyone's houses and thanks everyone for for, for, the, for the entree into their houses, and she names all the collections. And she's, it's a very much a who's who story um, of turn of the century New England when you read her books. Um, I do think she is definitely an amazing promoter of Salem. Okay, at a time that Salem was being promoted in one way. Okay, she is an adult in the 1890s when we really start to see some incredible tourism. Um, here in Salem, national tourism, largely fueled uh, by the 1892 anniversary of the Witch Trials. So it's that kind of tourism, okay? And she wants people to see Salem in another way, in another light. She, she very seldom refers to the Witch Trials, okay? She very seldom spotlights a house that has anything to do with the Witch Trials. She's all about the other Salem the Salem of craftsmanship and mariners who traveled the globe and brought back all this great stuff, okay? And this stuff just arrived in Salem. It's, it was a style that we should all emulate. So she's more into the light Salem than the dark Salem. Um, and then I, she writes a very influential article about Salem after the fire, uh, published in House Beautiful, which she's saying, it's not all gone. <laughs> you know, it's still here. Uh, and the new houses that are being built are being built in the colonial style that I've been writing about their panel career. So um, I would definitely say that she is a she's a Salem girl, okay, very through and through, try and try. Um, so this is the question I have, and again, not being an American historian, I know we have some great American historians here, so maybe they can help me. I'm not sure where I can whether I can put her in the forefront of a preservation movement. Or just someone who kind of wrote, often very romantically is trying to revive a lost way of life. This is one of her pictures of the House of Seven Gables Tea House. She loves tea houses. I'm going to get to <laughs> She loves them. She, so it's not, it's the way of life. It's, it's, um, it's not just the style. It's, it's sort of the way of life, a quieter way of life, a prettier way of life, a calmer way of life, okay, away from the hustle and the bustle. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about her family. I will say um, that Mary is a little, it's a little um, mysterious for most of her life. We have to bear in mind. Look at the, the dates here. Her first book, well, her first article is published in 1904. She picks up a pen when she's 54 years old, and then she never puts it down until the day she drops down. I swear. <laughs> so what is she doing for the first 54 years of her life? She's a little mysterious like Mrs. Emerton. You know, it's like homeschooled. She, she, I can't find a school. <laughs> I can't find anything about her. She does come um, from a, a, a very uh, well-connected, on both sides, both her maternal side and her, her paternal side, old See, all New England families. Okay, mostly from northern New England, okay, but settled in Salem in the 19th century. Her father, uh, William Dummer Northend, okay, who comes from the family after which the Dummer Academy, now called the Governor's Academy, is <laughs> um, 
was named, um, and her mother comes from a very prominent Newburyport family. So just all the connections of those two sides gets her entree into all these amazing houses, and that's a lot of her career right there. So he was um, an amateur historian. This is one of his books. He was a lawyer. Um, he was um, a state senator uh, for Salem. Very connected, uh, very eminent. Uh, his obituaries run several pages. You know, a very eminent man. Um, she, he and his wife, Susan Stedman, um, um, North End, had four children, um, three daughters, and a son. Um, and the son, the one son, William Wheelwright, North End, was an architect, okay, who was associated with uh, a, a, a quite a prominent architectural firm that did the renovations, not the original building. This is Salem Superior Court right on Federal Street oh. that you all recognize. The original building was a Gridley building, but it was subject to major renovations in the 1880s. Uh, so her brother did that. So she's very connected. And I have found different um, architectural drawings that are in her possession as well. So she had that architectural basis as well as that old New England basis. He died very young. He died in 1894. Okay, I don't know exactly how or why he died, but he died in 1894. The eldest sister married into a very prominent family, and then her father died in 1902. And she was left with her younger sister, who never married herself, and her mother. And they lived together in a house on Lime Street. I do think there were some money problems here. She writes about why she decided to pick up the pen at the age of 54. Which, you know, is kind of a big thing to do in 1904. <laughs> and she mostly says, you know, I was, I was sick. I had been sick. I had been ill. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't be very active. And I was looking for occupation. So I picked And I was surrounded by all these things that I wanted to talk about. So I picked up a pen. But do you think there's some money issues there, too? I, I, I think there's, there's something in the background, but again, I can't really prove that. I don't have her personal papers. Okay, so before I get, I'm mostly gonna talk about Mary, but I think it's really important to talk about Mary, to put Mary in a proper not context, not just of her family, okay, but also of her colleagues, really, in this work. Uh, because we have four phenomenal people. They're all roughly the same age, okay, living in Salem in the 1890s, 1910, 1920s, and really studying colonial Salem, writing about colonial Salem. Their idea of colonial is kind of broad. Okay, it's everything from, you know, the day the first settler landed to the death of McIntyre. Okay, they really, they really stretch it out. Uh, but that that is their era. And um, they are, really promoting colonialism, and, and, and I, I really wish I knew how all these people got along. Mm -hmm. I'm really not quite sure, but it's, to me, it seems like they form a very strong, self-referencing, connected community, okay, of Salem, usually we call them antiquarians, okay, that's like the word we use for pre-preservationist. So there's Frank Cousins, okay, who I have a particular interest in, Frank Cousins <coughs> mostly um, promoted Salem through photography. He's one of the first great architectural photographers. Um, he also, but he also had a shop, and he would sell, he would make and sell Salem souvenirs. He loved to promote Salem postcards. Um, and he also wrote several books about colonial architecture. So that's Frank Cousins. Um, we have Sidney Purley. Okay, who was a top school resident, a great historian of Salem, okay, knew everything. Just way before my colleague Tad Baker announced that Proctor's, and I would say this with him in the room, <laughs> announced that Proctor's Ledge uh, was the site of the witch uh, accusation, uh, executions, excuse me. Sidney Purley stated that in the 1920s. Um, so great antiquarian. See the similarity of their ages. They're all the same age. They're a generation. And then, of course, your girl. <laughs> See, again, it's the ages. And George Francis Dow, okay? 
guy, the, the great, who, who worked originally with Sidney Pearlie and then went, went on to really specialize in, in reproduction and colonial architecture at the Essex Institute. It's almost as hard, I'm very proud of this picture. To, do you know how long it took me to find a picture of George Francis Dow? There's no picture of George Francis Dow. <laughs> and I found that picture, so there you go. All right, so just a little bit of what they're doing. This is now, you know, literally 10, 15 years uh, before Mary Herod Northon, who became not only an author but a photographer, uh, as we will talk about. So her career, in many ways, is sort of mirroring and following the line of Frank Cousins. Frank Cousins <coughs> left an enormous archive, okay, of, of, of photographs of Salem houses, nearly every Salem house has been photographed, except Greek Revival houses. He hates Greek Revival houses. <laughs> <laughs> he will never photograph one. <laughs> but everything is photographed, and we have all these plates locked up in the Phillips Library, never to be seen again. <laughs> and we're so dependent on his visual record uh, of, of Salem. Here's the famous pineapple house. That was in behind behind Brown Street, where the St. Joseph Church is right now. Um, here's one of his stereo views of the Pickering House. Of course, very popular. Um, Frank Cousins, like uh, Mary Northam later on, published both for himself. He had his own photographic publishing company, but also for others. Um, so other people, like the Moltons, for instance, are putting these photographs out. out. So he, and the Halliday Company, who which later published Mary Northam. So he has great reach. Um, I have a whole collection. I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but I'm not going to give them to the Phillips Library. More. <laughs> More. This is the um, interior. I, just, I found this photo. This is a photo of 14 Cambridge Street, um, a McIntyre house on Cambridge Street, 14 Cambridge Street. Um, which um, I was looking for photographs of this because a friend of mine um, is now undertaking the restoration of this house. And mm -hmm. so I found this one, and I found um, one of the front stairway that was taken by Mary. Uh, this is the back taken by Frank Cousins, and I sent it to my friend, the architect, and I said, oh, here's the, the back staircase, and she said, oh, we just removed that. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it was a later edition. <laughs> so he had his own art company, um, the Frank Cousins Art Company. I should say, and, and, and um, even though his his uh, most of his photographs and plates are in the Phillips Library and they haven't been digitized, um, we have a number that have been digitized by Historic New England. Uh, so you can see more in Historic New England. Historic New England also has um, a nice repository of Mary's photographs. So I will be um, using historic New England's digitization quite a bit. But so Frank is not just, Cousins is not just all, you know, high level architecture though. He is definitely selling stuff, mm -hmm. all right? He's a salesman. Uh, we're gonna talk about ye old Salem later on. <laughs> he's the first to come out with this ye old rich city. I mean, well, after Daniel loved it with the spoon, but he's the first one to really sort of come out with these postcards. Mm -hmm. Um, copyright 1902, Frank Cousins. These are out in huge numbers, okay? Very, very, thousands of postcards. Who knows how many? Uh, this was his shop on Essex Street, okay? And trade cards from the Beatty House. Made all sorts of things, all sorts of souvenir things. So, so again, all these people on tape, I mean, Sidney Pearlie, um, Dow, these are more academic people, but but I think Cousins comes closest to Mary in being, you know, very, very practical, very entrepreneurial, okay? Seeing value, okay, in what Salem is or what people think Salem is, okay? And, and, and putting it out there to a national audience. Pearlie, uh, more academic, Pearlie is known for, for, for a whole bunch of publications, but I think his most influential and his most um, impressive, at least to me, is the Essex Antiquarian, which is a journal that he published uh, from 1897 to 1909, in which he, re he reconstitutes, in each issue, 
he reconstitutes a different part of Salem mm -hmm. um, as it was in 1700. Mm -hmm. um, and he does this because he's a lawyer, okay, probate and property lawyer. He, he does it mostly through wills and property mm -hmm. inventories. And so he tells us, he recreates and draws all these houses Okay, and tells us the history of these houses, houses that are still standing, houses that are long gone. It's kind of an idealistic vision, but it's still because it is based on these de this deed information, which is still how we trace house histories today. Um, it's enormously valuable. If I want to date a house in Salem, and I did this in graduate school, the first thing I'd do is go to Pearly. I mean, the very first thing I'd do, and I think most people are like that. But the other great thing about Pearly, he, he too, is willing to sort of, even though he has a more academic inclination, um, he's very willing to sort of go into the national spotlight. So this is a this is a um, an article that was in every newspaper um, in 1903. Tradition of famous old Salem ma mansion attacked by skeptic who doubts its authenticity. The witch house had all previously been mostly referred to as the Roger Williams house. Uh, but Pearlie says Roger Williams never lived in that house. They had nothing to do with Roger Williams. <laughs> we can't call it the Roger Williams house anymore. And this is, this is good. I mean, stories like this is good, but on the other hand, then it really became the witch house. Yeah. Somehow, I think, I think he wanted it to become the Corwin house, but it became the witch house. It was already colloquially called that, and then it became more so. Um, these are some more headlines. I love Sidney Pearlie's headlines because it's so funny. I, I love history to be so, you know, topical and controversial. It's really exciting. This was the big debate, okay, over what, you know, the, what was always called um, the first meeting house in back in Plummer Hall at the Essex Institute. It was always called the first meeting house, and then certainly Sidney Pearlie said, it's not the first meeting house. So they convened a kind of neat committee Okay, and proved um, subject of dispute of Salem. And how can you beat that headline? Yeah. Is that the best headline of all time? I mean, mm -hmm. I love it. Um, Pearly proved, um, and others on the committee proved that it was not, in fact, the first meeting house. It was, a, it was in fact, the Quaker meeting house from later on in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. Okay, he was always looking for someone to go into the Narbonne house, which went back and forth in relative shape. He's trying to get the DA artists to make that their headquarters. They didn't do it. And then, look at this. Dispute over the family of Salem. You can't beat this. This is a dispute, okay, between Sidney Purley, okay, and William Crowning Shield Endicott. Okay, Purley saying Roger Conant is the first founder of Salem. So we've got to have the church in 1626. Endicott saying, no, my relative Endicott uh, is the first thing we got to have it in 1628. A real dispute, okay, which Pearly won. Um, so <coughs> this is the world, this is the whole, so this is still, look at the dates there, okay, those are still, that, that's the date, right, those are the dates right there, are Mary North End's career, okay, so she is entering, once she enters this stage, she is entering the stage where Salem is really big news. Okay, people are talking about Salem in terms of its the anniversary, in terms of the witches, of course, <laughs> in terms of everything. Okay, and then I don't mean to talk anything about this. You guys know all about this, but I want to put obviously Mrs. Edmonton and her architect in the context. These are uh, North End photographs of before and after. <coughs> So this is 1908, 1910. Okay, uh, the old bakery, 1911. The retired Beckett House, 1924. We're still in that period. Okay, teens, up to the 20s. And then George, Fr the senior. Can you imagine when I was putting this together? <coughs> I was like, I can't believe how big a year 1910 was. <laughs> I mean, 1910 was the year that, that this house was open to the public, and also the Ward House. You know, the first, you know, first period has to be moved and set up entirely. First, you know, museum community. Incredible. So all of this is making big headlines. Okay, so here we have some more cousins. Um, 
uh, postcards that are again reaching quite a wide audience. These, this is just one, there's two versions of the same one, again focusing on the witch house because the witch house really got a lot of headlines after Hurley's announcement that it was not Roger Williams' house. So we start to see that word if you do searches in um, newspapers, in magazines, in any sort of popular press, you're going to see that phrase Old Salem spelled with an E or not quite a bit. Okay. Mary is certainly not the first one to market it, um, but you see that. Now, I want to think about Old Salem in terms of preservation, but also image and also culture. Um, here are three um, artifacts that, that I really like that kind of sum it up for me. Um, uh, there's a great, of course, intermingling between preservation and arts and crafts movements. A lot of really attention to traditional crafts. Um, here we have um, some stitch work. Uh, these are actually models and templates that were uh, marketed at the time, again, of Crowning Shieldsworth, Old Salem. These are, this is a study, and this is the finished product, okay, for um, fabric, upholstery fabric, by the Mallinson fabric company, and, and that's a pattern called Old Salem Gardens, okay, with the gables right there front and center, but other houses included as well. I focused on the gables because it's you. Uh, <laughs> so, so think of it in, in, in multiple ways, um, as material culture, okay, as well as image for, for this city. So that's the contract I learned from Marian. Okay, she's in the position to take advantage of a lot of this, okay? Because she has, she has, she has time, she, she obviously has a passion for writing, she's a writing style that, it is, I don't know if it would really be popular today, <laughs> but, in her, but in her own day, it was quite accessible and quite personal. Um, she, but mostly she has the connections. She, you know, she writes about her past in a very personal way and in a very material way. If you read this book, Memories of Old Salem, and most of her books, okay, are available digitized through, uh, you can find them on Google Books or archive.com, the Internet Archive. This one certainly is, Memories of Old Salem. And she just talks about, you know, childhood memories of teapots and fabric and furniture, really tangible things, okay? It's not dry, old, dusty event history. Okay, it's really home-based history. There's, of course, a long tradition of women doing this. It goes all the way, in my own period that I study, the Elizabethan period, women are starting to write about their homes. So there's nothing she's really doing that's so cutting edge here. But she does it in a very, very effective way. Um, she was very sought after. Almost from her first publication in 1904, I can just see a flurry almost every month okay, of articles published in national publications such as you see here. So in the end, we have 11 best-selling books, okay, that were published and republished and republished, sell them out of print, really, in her lifetime and for about a decade after. 185 articles that I counted. There might be more. And an archive of 30,000 photographs. Okay, when she first started writing, her magazine editor said to, to her, you need photographs. Okay, and so she started either taking them or getting someone else to take them for her. She maintains that she's a photographer. She's often called photographer. Now that she's starting to become steady, we're kind of torn whether she took them, okay, or she has a photographer take them for her. She's definitely saying that they're her in her mm -hmm. time, definitely. Uh, but now you see in citations about her, it says for by. <laughs> we just don't know. Um, one of the things I'm dying, I'm looking, I've been looking everywhere for um, is a picture of her behind the camera. <laughs> Never <mind. laughs> I also really want to see a picture of her in a car because, you know, she talks about her trips. I mean, this this is what I like doing, just driving around the countryside looking at 17th century home, stopping in the antique shops. That's what she does. <laughs> <laughs> and she gets paid for it. And, it, and often you feel like it's, 
a form of liberation for her that you remember. You know, she was there in that house on Line Street till she was 54 and picked up the pen. And then with her mom and her sister and a lot of responsibilities, and then suddenly she, she was out there on the road. <laughs> so, um, as you can see, the, the importance of the Gables cannot be underestimated. She writes extensively about the impact that the Gables had on her, on Salem, on the nation. She puts it right in the picture in this gold-edged book, Historic Homes of New England, which was one of her most best-selling items. So, the Gables, I think, very much is, is an ongoing influence. She takes some she or whoever's taking them forward takes some lovely photographs. <laughs> <laughs> so with the restoration of the house of the Seven Gables, it has taken on a life that is surely worthy of the interest shown not only by Salem people, but by the <coughs> guests. And some of her photographs go into the pictorial dimension, which was popular at the time, a kind of hazy romantic view of the past. She's going that way a little bit, but then she backs up. Uh, she doesn't clearly want to be put there all together. But this is a new art. Really, Frank Cousins and a lot of his colleagues in his 1880s and 1890s have created sort of this specific genre of architectural photography. And now she's joining it with no training, OK? And so she has different, she fools around with different techniques. Um, over the course of her career. This is pretty straightforward. Again, the Pickering House. This is the front parlor of the Waters House on Cambridge Street, which is now being beautifully restored, <laughs> that she took. She, uh, the difference, major difference between her and Cousins, Cousins isn't, re he's interested in architectural detail, but he's not interested in things. Okay, she is. She wants to show the pewter. She wants to show the glass. She loves mirrors. She loves mirrors. She loves any form of glass. And I think she's most reputable when she talks about glass. So she zeroes in on the details. And you know she loves curtains and soft furniture. She loves all that stuff. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot more soft. But I would argue it's not quite as soft as wall snagging. You guys have all heard of wall snagging? OK. Great sort of colonial revivalist. Um, author and photographer and furniture maker. I mean, he really wanted to provide the colonial rub in an amazing way. So I wanted to sort of compare Wallace Nutting's photos, okay, with hers. And again, most of hers, these, this is not representative of her work. Most of her work is straightforward, okay? But she also did sell specific prints, single items that she signed, just like Wallace Nutting did. Mm -hmm. And people would write to her and say, oh, I'm on a picture of McIntyre Fence. And she'd, she'd give them a kind of softer version of it that was kind of Wallace Nutting-esque. So there you have Wallace Nutting, and then you have Mary. OK? Here you, Wallace Nutting generally has people. You know, it's colonial dress up for Wallace Nutting. She seldom puts people in her books. Somehow she does. But very, very seldom. This was uh, the newly moved ward house, okay? And this was actually an advertisement for the White Pine Company. So they had hired her to do that. So, of course, that's how the, the guys at the ward house were all dressed up anyway uh, at that time. So it wouldn't have been too out of play. So this is a style called the Pictorialist. It's, it's kind of a photographic movement at the turn of the century. Have a lot of women represented in this movement. So you have uh, Myra Albert Wiggins in 1900 in, in Oregon. Okay, you have the Allen sisters in Stark Deerfield. Okay, and then, and then I could put Mary there, but I don't think she belongs there. So instead I'm putting this woman named Florence Thompson, who, who was also a sound photographer, who I don't know much about at all. This is Safford House. But in all of her photographs, they're all soft, and she's always got wistful women. <laughs> it's always wistful women, not, not working women, but kind of ethereal women, <laughs> who are just sort of floating in. <laughs> Mary would not do that, okay, because Mary is too practical, okay? So um, I really want to uh, emphasize the practicality of Miss Northend. 
because I don't think she's she's a wistful woman. So here's a popular book. She goes she goes back and forth between very specific historical books and very local books, and then she at certain times in her career she's definitely aiming for a national audience. Okay. Still, the examples that she always uses are New England or specifically Massachusetts examples. Okay, because that's the exemplar. Uh, but she's still shooting for a national audience. So here's just a little bit about, I mean, you can read this for yourself. This is available, but this is the tone. For your colonial room, there could be nothing more suitable than a crane with an old iron kettle fire back illuminated by fitful flames, wrought iron and, owner, iron, and irons with fluted brass tops, and trivet waiting for the kettle when the water boils. So you see all those all those accessories, all those colonial <coughs> accessories, which now come to the fore. I remember when I bought my first house, I, I went out and I bought all these fireplace accessories, <laughs> and I brought them home, and, and my father was like, those aren't antiques. <laughs> they were made in the 1920s, and, you know, inspired by this. <laughs> so what did she like? Every home, I mean, she, she's, she gets adaptable. There's even... Wait for it. A bungalow. In one of her later works. Okay? <laughs> but for the most part, a bungalow. But for most part, this is what she really likes. She loves mirrors. The more mirrors, the merrier. She does advocate for spinning wheels near the heart. She really does. And you can find many pictures of North End spinning wheels. She loves her plants. Okay? And braided bugs. She loves fire buckets. She loves them. She loves chimps, which is really not probably at all. <laughs> she loves it. She loves built-ins. She goes on and on. She loves, you know, uh, window seats in particular, corner covers. She's never mad at corner covers she didn't like. I know my 1827 house has corner covers in the, in the dining room that were added in the 1920s. <laughs> I don't know if it was because of her. There you go. That's perfection for her. Mm -hmm. So she has definitely softened it up. It's not, it's not your Spartan colonial look. She's, she's softening it a lot. She loves seasonal decorating. Mm -hmm. She is the ultimate seasonal decorator. <laughs> this is her own parlor, which she would decorate for the seasons. This is spring. This is summer. And that's fall. Okay, same parlor, George Washington proudly displayed, of course. And this is Christmas. <laughs> Just, I don't know, it's too pagan. <laughs> so, I mean, she really likes seasonal things. She goes all out. <laughs> And that is her house, oh, which I'm so happy to have a nice picture of. It wasn't painted for years and years and years, and it was painted last summer. So I went out on that beautiful day after the last snowstorm that we, the next sec to last snowstorm that we had, <laughs> and the sun was shining. She was on this side. Okay. I think it, I think her brother might have been the aunt, but the other side is the aunt. I'm just not sure. We can't hear you. Okay. What you can't hear me? No. I think her, her brother might have been on the other side, but I'm not sure. She, she for, uh, for the whole period of her career, she was living on the right-hand side uh, with her mother, okay, still very much alive. Uh, her mother actually survived her. And um, her sister, her unmarried sister. Now, I mean, this is where, just to get back to this house for a minute, it's a beautiful, beautiful house, but this is where I think money might have had something to do with it. She's talking about Chestnut Street houses, Federal Street houses, in, 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 a, in a kind of interesting way. It's not voyeuristic, um, but I, I get the sense that she would have wanted to live there if she could have. Uh, maybe I'm 
taking on too much with this. I, she doesn't certainly tell me this in any straightforward way. But Lime Street was a really busy street. Um, the trolley went right through it. They were complaining about the trolley running right through because it, it was a narrow street. You know, this is right in the heart of downtown Salem. And she's writing about much more restful, detached, peaceful houses. <laughs> so she, like, you know, like Martha, is very much about entertaining. It's not just seasonal decorating. We've got all sorts of lo special lunch, breakfast, evening, seasonal menus, okay, that she publishes in national articles. This is just one of, I, geez, I, I don't know, 50 or 60 um, articles that I found about food. <coughs> but we all need a good 10 cent dessert, right? <laughs> Um, the tea houses, I think she's on the, kind of the forefront of that, I think, and again, American historians might disagree with me. This is an influential article that she wrote in the summer of 1915, The Coming of the Tea House, and she talks about several tea houses that she's visited, and she's so attracted to them because the tea house, all the tea houses, particularly the ones she visits, have very colonial interiors, so they're in Ipswich. They have kettles, they have all the accessories. Uh, but she's also really impressed with them because the women, the women are running them. The women are running them. Mm -hmm. Ladies are running them. Um, and ladies are going to them. You know, it just seems very feminist -y, the way she's talking about these tea houses. Um, and she took lots of pictures of tea. Here's the gables. Beautiful North End picture. She took a whole wheel of uh, North End photos of the Gables tea houses. This is the Fernery Tea Room in Salem. Mm -hmm. Does that still exist? No. Mm -hmm. It's well, the building does. It's 119, 133. I forgot the. Nelson, do you know what the Fernery was? It's not on the one main street covers. Oh, yeah? Really? Oh, that's oh, great. Right <laughs> good. It's good to know. Martha Ann Tea House. Where is that? That was on Essex as well. And again, I'm not quite sure where. Lots of pictures there. We, she does have it. I, 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 these are not included. This would be, there's a lot, there's a lot of room for scholarship on Mary Harry. Have I, I five minutes? Yeah. Oh, just, <laughs> sorry. A, we have a big slate of group tours coming in, and the three o'clock women's history tours nestled oh, in the uh, middle of the Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. There's a lot of pictures of women's work. This is the Esther Mack School. She's not included in any of her, any of her publications. So she's obviously, she's got some interest in, in, in traditional crafts and women's work in general. Gardens. Okay, loves gardens. Every garden must have a sundial. She wrote a little book about the sundial. <laughs> and antiques. This is another thing. She's right at the forefront. This is another one of her stage photos. I think she's going into the old bakery, buying a teapot from some unsuspecting person inside. OK? Um, so here we are, right in the moment of the invention of antiques, and people are realizing what they have and what they don't have. So on the road again, we visit the Lynn's. That's my favorite. One, um, again, I want to see her in her car. So just bring it back far, we have a total um, colonial revival style based on Salem. Salem is the exemplar, okay? The wonderful good collection of antiques for which Salem is noted. We modeled in which she follows her friends and neighbors out into the country and writes about their houses. This is the influential book that I was article in House Beautiful that talks about the rebuilding in colonial style of Salem after the Great Fire of 1914. This is one of those. This is the Bachelor House on Lafayette Street. And she's noting the colonial detail. So this is where I say she's not strict preservationist. She's just like the colonial style, older new. And that opened up a world of you know new colonial homes for her. As we go into the 1920s, she's definitely <coughs> ranging and loosening up about this when we get the bungalow. This is her last book, and historic doorways of old Salem. She kind of goes back to you know, pure sale and pure architecture. Gets a rave <coughs> review, okay, um, in the New York Times. 
Okay, this book was published in the year that she died. Um, she had a terrible car crash um, in the fall of 1926, right after this book was published, and she died from injuries sustained in that crash. Not quite sure exactly what happened. She recovered for a bit, but then fell away, as they say. Okay, and we'll just close with this. Americans owe a particular debt to Mary Harry North End. I love this picture of her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for the work she has done in preserving in book form by pictures and descriptive texts, um, the home life of colonial days. Salem has been lately celebrating with fervor and picturesqueness her third hundred birthday, and so this book comes to remind us of gracious traditions. So I, <coughs> excuse me, I look at that golden summer for her of 1926. This is the first Chestnut Street day of 1926 in celebration of the tercentenary. This would have been all that she dreamed of. <laughs> and it was a perfect golden summer for her, and then she dies in the fall. Uh, but certainly her contemporaries use the word preserve again and again and again. So I guess by their standards, we can certainly call her a preservationist. OK, that's it. All right, back <laughs> Questions. Okay. Anyone? Um, you mentioned that you're um, a European historian, now Harry Harrod. Is that associated at all? Do you know with the Harrod families of London, the Harrods department store? Jeez, that really never even occurred to me. Yeah. Oh my gosh, there's a whole article right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. You were next. Did she ever write about the social life of the families in Salem? The the. What comes close to it is that book, Memories of Old Salem. That's about the, she talks about Chestnut, Chestnut Street, she talks about Hilton Hall and the dances there. That's the one that comes closest. Most of the time she's really stand, stepping outside and talking about style. But that, Memories of Old Salem, is really nice. Yeah. Yeah, Nelson? The last picture of Mary Mount and the drug wagon in the collection downstairs at the library. I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. I like to pick up Mary Knott and Bowie, so we're a drunk wagon in the sales. Oh, yeah. A couple of kids more times than that coming. Okay. Where is it? Well, I was also supposed to stop in the morning. Is it sensing? Of course. Johnny, you were quick on your answers if you want to take two more. <laughs> quick, um, I take it she never married, and did she ever write fictional no. things? No, no, no. No, no, no. With the um, biggest collection of her pictures now. It's divide. I thank you for asking because I've neglected to do that, sir. Historic New England, okay, all digitized, and Whitaker, also digitized. But that's only a small fraction. We don't know where the rest are. We know that when she died, both William Sumner Appleton of the, of then Svenia, um, and the Duponts wanted to buy up her her archives, particularly her photographic archives. And they got small fractions, but we don't know where everything else is. We don't know where maybe 15,000 pictures are, or plays. Yeah. <laughs> Why is Salem noted as the witch city and not too many other places? Too many other places. That's the question. I, 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 for myself, I really think it's that, it's that, um, that tourism in the 1890s, coincidental with the with the uh, bicentennial. That was big tourism. It was just as big as we do now. <laughs> so Salem has been which city for a long time. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Seeger.